I'm Richard Wagaman, and I'm going to be talking about endings in Shakespeare. My subtitle is, Is This the Promised End? As Sigmund Freud and many other analysts have acknowledged, we can learn an enormous amount about human psychology from great literature. What can we learn from literature about endings in therapy and in analysis? To explore this question, I will focus especially on Shakespeare. We sometimes idealize the termination of a psychoanalysis in the, with the hope that all major conflicts have been fully resolved. Freud once thought that such conflicts could never emerge again until he had been in practice longer. Shakespeare seems to know just how much we want things to be resolved in our lives, but he repeatedly shows us that anything like full resolution is an illusion. Endings test our tolerance for separation. The more meaningful the relationship with our patient or with a literary work, the more charged its termination will be. Some otherwise good novels just fizzle out rather than end in a way that does justice to the book. Similarly, one or both participants in a good psychotherapy may shirk from facing all the feelings stirred by ending their work. Endings also test our perfectionism, our wish that a treatment or a book should only end when some perfectionistic and therefore impossible goal has been attained. There is also the category of surprise endings, whether in literature or in treatment. Amy Holmes wrote a novel called In a Country of Mothers, where the treatment is about to crash when the therapist realizes her patient is the child she gave up for adoption years earlier. In a cartoon about termination, a patient gets up from the analytic couch, points a gun at the analyst and says, you've helped me a lot, doc, but you know too much. In the realm of real treatments, C.P. Oberndorf published a case report back in 1939 where the patient realized only as the analysis was ending that it was, it was his secondary personality that had been in analysis, something the analyst had not suspected. At termination, do we want our patients to have a sense of closure? I believe we do, but we probably do not want this closure to imply that the work of self-examination is now complete. Instead, we hope that the patient will use the tools they have acquired in our work to continue to be curious about their symptoms and conflicts, furthering what the analyst Robert Gardner called the ongoing post-termination work of self-inquiry. I'll be talking a lot about Shakespeare's plays. Plays end with a curtain call. Are there any parallels between curtain calls and ending treatment? We do bow out of the patient's life, but let's hope we don't literally invite applause. What I have in mind is the transition at the end of every play where we implicitly or explicitly begin seeing the actors as real rather than fictitious persons. This reminds me of my pivotal experience with one literary work. When I was 16, I enormously enjoyed what I thought was a novel called I Never Promised You a Rose Garden by Joanne Greenberg. Twenty years later, I crossed the boundary constituted by the ending of that book by going to work at Chestnut Lodge, the actual hospital where that non-fiction memoir took place. Later still, I was delighted to be able to tell Joanne Greenberg herself that story when I met her. One notion about the termination of analysis is that the patient should gradually resolve their distorted transference experience of who the analyst is and begin to see the analyst more realistically. Traditionally, this included more of a sense of equality in contrast with an earlier idealized image of the analyst. With the changes brought about by relational analysis, there's probably more of a sense of equality all along now. Judy Kantrowitz's book, 
Myths of Termination, includes sobering vignettes about analysts trying to impose an ongoing relationship with patients following termination when the patient wants to go their own way. How does a treatment or a literary work continue to have an impact after its ending? The psychologist Jonathan Shedler has emphasized research that shows psychodynamic therapy leads to ongoing improvement during the months and years <clears throat> following termination. Pardon me, I need a drink. He gives this as one of many reasons to be skeptical about the overblown claims of efficacy of so-called cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. Our goal is to give the patient the tools that lead to ongoing self-inquiry as a method for dealing with their symptoms and relationship problems. I'm tempted to compare CBT with a pulp novel that has little lasting impact once we finish the last page. Something that is too neatly tied up is easier to forget, partly because it's not realistic. Great literature, by contrast, gets inside us and changes who we are and how we think. That is perhaps uniquely true of Shakespeare. Helen Bendler said any poem that can be adequately paraphrased in prose has failed as a poem, perhaps because it needs to communicate with both our conscious and with our unconscious self-states to be more successful as a poem. It may be the very lack of full resolution of Shakespeare's plays and poetry that help them get under our skin and take, take up permanent residence inside us. Great writers like Shakespeare may projectively identify some of their unresolvable conflicts into us. Now that's a term you may not be familiar with. It means an unconscious process of inducing unwanted emotions in the other person, or the reader, or the audience. As I continue talking about Shakespeare, I'll ask you to ponder possible connections with your therapeutic work if you're a mental health professional. In a 1985 article titled Shakespeare Closing, Columbia's Bernard Beckerman noted that Shakespeare sets us up to anticipate a certain kind of ending in his plays, only to surprise us with something unexpected. For example, a history play might have a tragic ending, or a play may end without any clear resolution, forcing us to contain our own unresolved feelings about what we've learned from that play. Beckerman offers a perceptive overview of how Shakespeare's plays end and the impact this has on the audience. In Shakespeare's comedies, he observes that the resolution of the play regularly includes what he calls an unmasking, usually of someone who has been literally in disguise. This might be a cross-gender disguise, such as Viola in Twelfth Night, after serving Count Orsino as an ostensible male. In Measure for Measure, the Duke pretends to leave the city for a time, only to remain in disguise as a simple friar. In A Winter's Tale, Hermione, sorry, in A Winter's Tale, Paulina unmasks the statue of the long-dead Hermione as actually being the still-living Hermione. Or, one can interpret, it, interpret this as a fairy tale or a miraculous resurrection. <clears throat> Endings of comedies often include res reconciliation between enemies and reunions of separated families. Does termination of treatment involve any unmasking? Yes, often it does. We hope that our patients will view us more realistically by the end of treatment, and they are often more willing to reveal transference feelings they had earlier concealed. When the patient had been viewing us through an idealizing transference, we are a bit like the magician Prospero at the end of the Tempest when he says to the audience, Now my charms are all o'erthrown, and what strength I have's mine own, which is most faint. As you from crimes would pardon be, let your indulgence set me free. Shakespeare rebelled against the convention of tying up all the loose ends in his plays. As Beckerman perceptively points out, 
we see an evolution toward greater tolerance of uncertainty and ambiguity in the respective endings of the earlier and later versions of King Lear. In the earlier quarto version, the final words are conventionally assigned to the highest-ranking character, who is Albany. In the later, first folio version, it is instead Edgar who is the last to speak. As Beckerman puts that Shakespeare was thus, quote, accenting the utter disruption of order and the leaderless condition of the state. A further change is to make Lear's state of mind more ambiguous. He knows Cordelia is dead in the earlier text, but in the later one he is trying to persuade himself she is still alive, saying, Do you see this? Look on her. Look on her lips. Look there. Look there. Beckerman observes, instead of closure in Lear's death, there is uncertainty and bewilderment. I borrowed my subtitle, Is This the Promised End? from King Lear. By the fifth act, Lear has been losing his mind, breaking our hearts in the process. Stephen Booth feels that the end of King Lear are the most terrifying five minutes in literature, as he puts it. The death of Lear's daughter Cordelia has been so devastating for audiences that for 150 years the actual play was rarely performed. Instead, Nahum Tate's 18, sorry, 1681 version with a happy ending was used instead. One scholar said of the ending of Lear, quote, Maybe the apocalypse came and went and we are already in hell. That scholar, Roger Christophides, studied the way Shakespeare characteristically frustrates our expectations of clear-cut resolutions in the endings of his tragedies. Given the inherent ambiguity of language, Christophides sees the apocalypse as, quote, the moment when God provides final, stable meaning. Quote, without this eternally adjourned judgment day, there is no truth, end of quote. Christophides studies the failure of the apocalypse to arrive in Shakespeare so that it cannot resolve the profound ambiguities posed by his tragedies. Near the end of King Lear, the evil Edmund has a change of heart and sends orders to spare Cordelia's life after ordering her execution. But he is too late. A few lines later, Lear comes on stage carrying the dead Cordelia in his arms. He reveals his derangement by first saying, She's as dead as earth, then immediately contradicting himself and saying, If her breath will mist a looking glass, why then she lives. Like all of us, Lear struggles to accept the final ending of death. This is the moment when Lear's loyal retainer looking on asks, Is this the promised end? We can easily imagine that Kent's backstory includes his having enormous respect for the person that Lear once was. Many lines in Shakespeare have an ability, an immense and lasting emotional impact, often in a highly condensed way, that is able to communicate with us on both conscious and unconscious levels. Kent's question is rich with possible meanings. It is commonly thought to refer to the end of the world. Lear is ending the nearing the end of his life, and Kent also seems to ask if such misery is in store for all of us, despite our best hopes and our and Christian promises of an afterlife. Lear dies as he is convincing himself that the dead Cordelia's lips are moving. Kent then says to Edgar, Vex not his ghost, oh, let him pass. He hates him that would upon the rack of this tough world stretch him out longer. Let Lear's torture end, in other words. But let's not ignore the pun on the word longer. Even in the midst of this nearly unbearable scene, Shakespeare can't resist a good pun. Living longer and being longer in height, thanks to the rack. Laughing in the face of death is an attractive option.
We hope that endings of treatment will highlight and integrate what has come before. Major themes of the analysis often resurface and can be reworked during the termination phase. Shakespeare's play Cymbeline is unusually rife with disguised identities. In a tour de force, Shakespeare packs the final scene with two dozen reversals and recognitions. It is almost as though Shakespeare is mocking our craving for resolution, for having all mysteries unveiled and clarified. One critic contends that Cymbeline looks back on all of Shakespeare's previous plays, subtly alluding to the entire canon. Helen Bendler, in her landmark study of Shakespeare's sonnets, observes that the final two lines, or couplet, integrate the sonnet by incorporating key words and themes from the previous 12 lines. Quentin Skinner makes a fascinating observation about Shakespeare's typical endings. Rhetoricians all agreed with Quintilian that the per oratio, or ending, is when quote, we are allowed to open up the full flood of our eloquence. By contrast, Skinner notes that, quote, some of Shakespeare's most intensely forensic scenes come to an end without any such per oratio. Further, when Shakespeare does imitate a more conventional rhetorical ending, he does so in a way that undermines rather than strengthens the points being made. Shakespeare always resists resolving complexity with simplistic solutions. As Skinner puts it, quote, it often seems that Shakespeare has a constitutional antipathy towards the conclusive. Wendler says that when a given sonnet ends with a couplet that sounds proverbial, it suggests that Shakespeare is giving up on trying to solve the problems posed by that sonnet. Sadly, when treatment ends in a complete or partial stalemate, it similarly implies that we or the patient or both of us have given up on some or all of the treatment goals we started with. Bendler's observations on Shakespeare's sonnet couplets offer other insights into endings. As you know, a Shakespearean sonnet has 14 lines organized into three quatrains, or groups of four lines, followed by a final couplet. Bendler notes that Shakespeare uses his sonnets not only to describe and enact his experiences, but also to analyze those experiences. She adds, quote, the distance from one's own experience necessitated by such an analytic stance is symbolized most fully by the couplet, whereas the empathetic perception necessary to display one's state of mind is symbolized, symbolized by the three quatrains. Bendler also believes that the three quatrains disingenuously convey a conceit of a spontaneous but fictive speaker. It is then in the couplet that Shakespeare himself steps forward and we can see him most clearly. Henry James made a similar observation about the character of Prospero in The Tempest, which James took to be Shakespeare's final play, or the ending of a brilliant literary career. Since James was stunningly perceptive about Shakespeare's use of an artistic mask, I will quote him at some length. The man himself in the plays, that is the author, we directly touch to my consciousness positively nowhere. We are dealing too perpetually with the artist, the monster and magician of a thousand masks. Here in the Tempest, at last the artist is, comparatively speaking, so generalized, so consummate and typical, so frankly amused with himself, that is with his art, with his power, with his theme, that it is as if, he came to meet us more than his usual halfway, and as if thereby in meeting him and touching him, we were nearer to meeting and touching the man. It is as if Shakespeare had swum into our ken from another planet to make of our poor world a great flat table for receiving the glitter and clink of his outpoured treasure. James is tormented by the traditional misconception that Shakespeare ceased writing for the last several years of his life. James wrote, its power to torment us intellectually seems scarcely to be born. I have to clarify that evidence suggests that James was skeptical 
of the legendary belief that the merchant of Stratford wrote Shakespeare's works. James's story, The Birthplace, recounts the growing doubts of the historical Joseph Skipsey as he encountered skeptical tourists in Stratford. The essay from which I have been quoting was published in Sidney Lee's edition of Shakespeare, and James knew that Lee would not allow James to express directly his doubts about the traditional authorship theory. So it's time for me to confess that I am a Shakespeare authorship heretic myself. Sorry. I agree with Freud that the Earl of Oxford, among his many pen names, used the pseudonym William Shakespeare. Are there any connections between the Earl of Oxford and the theme of endings in the works of Shakespeare? There sure are. Bendler said of the sonnets and James said of the Tempest that, as Shakespeare is nearing the end of a poem or of his writing career, respectively, he comes farther forward as the person he really was, in contrast with his various masks. We might ponder the strain Oxford felt about, about being required to conceal his identity as the author of these greatest works of literature. Just as psychoanalysts often are at greater, greatest risk of boundary violations, that is, unethical conduct, during the termination phase, Oxford seemed to find it hardest to accept his anonymity in writing this last play, The Tempest. As he neared death, it would be natural for him to worry whether court insiders who knew he was the author would tell his story to future generations, as the dying Hamlet asks Horatio to do. Let me now summarize some of the traumatic experiences with separations and endings in Oxford's 54 years, that is, from 1550 to 1604. Oxford's father died when Oxford was only 12. Soon afterwards, his older sister, Catherine, took Oxford to court unsuccessfully, trying to have the court declare Oxford a bastard. If she had succeeded, she hoped to take away his sizable inheritance. He was then removed from his mother, who died six years earlier, when he was 18. Queen Elizabeth had him raised by William Cecil, though Oxford may have suspected Cecil of having had his father killed. Imagine that. When Oxford was 21, Cecil had him marry Cecil's daughter, Anne. Twelve years later, Anne died a few days after giving birth to their fourth child. During the years following Anne's death, Oxford seemed to feel remorse for how wretchedly he had treated her. His plays suggest he may have developed some insight into his past proclivity to feel groundless jealousy of her. In fact, he may have used some of his plays to make reparation to his deceased wife, as he accused himself of acting like Othello and Leontes of The Winter's Tale. Although Queen Elizabeth exiled him from court for what another courtier had called his fickle head, he may have been Queen Elizabeth's lover, and he was definitely one of her favorites. When she died in March of 1603, Oxford wrote, In this common shipwreck, mine is above all the rest, who least regarded, though often comforted, of all her followers. She hath left to try my fortune among the alterations of time and chance, either without sail whereby to take advantage of any prosperous gale, or with anchor to ride till the storm be overpassed. I find those the most moving words in Oxford's 80-plus surviving letters. That final phrase, till the storm be overpassed, is found in Richard Day's 1578, A Prayer Against despair. Quote, depart not from me in the time of my need, but to defend thou me till this storm be overpassed. And the phrase is used comically by Trinculo in The Tempest. I will hear shroud, next to the newly discovered Caliban, till the dregs of the storm be passed. And there were only two prior uses of storm be passed in the large database early English books online. Among other losses for Oxford, the Queen's death might have threatened his financial solvency. Since 1586, she had granted him an annuity of a thousand pounds per year, roughly one million dollars today, 
presumably for his theatrical work in general, starting with his pro-Tudor history plays. Oxford was ill during the months leading up to his death. In late 1604, a few months after Oxford's death in June, his youngest daughter, Susan, got married. Oxford wrote his final version of The Tempest while he was facing the marriage of Susan to Phil Philip Herbert. Herbert later became the Earl of Pembroke, to whom Shakespeare's first folio was co-dedicated in 1623. Susan's engagement to Herbert became official in October, three months after Oxford's death. A biographer wrote their engagement took place, quote, after long love. Herbert's uncle was the illustrious Philip Sidney, who died in 1586. Sidney and Oxford were arch rivals, starting when Anne Cecil's engagement to Sidney was broken so she could marry Oxford. The marriage of Oxford's daughter to his old rival's nephew echoes the marriage in the Tempest of Miranda to Ferdinand, son of Prospero's old enemy, Alonso. So, I believe Oxford finished the Tempest when he was coping with multiple endings. He had lost the queen. He was struggling to relinquish his youngest daughter, Susan, to marriage, and he was contemplating his own impending death. He may have written the play to be performed posthumously for Susan's wedding celebration. In fact, in 1728, someone recorded an oral tradition that Shakespeare wrote an unnamed play for his daughter at the time of his retirement from the stage. So that legend is perfectly consistent with the theory that Oxford wrote The Tempest for his daughter Susan. It's been said that Shakespeare understands us better than we understand ourselves. Harold Bloom claims Shakespeare invented human consciousness. We should not dismiss Booth's claim just because it is hyperbolic. We may feel so profoundly understood by Shakespeare partly because he has helped make us who we are. We speak of memes, M-E-M-E, -M -E, as an idea or behavior that spreads virus-like from one person to another. Shakespeare is a sort of super meme that has penetrated deeply into our minds. There is all sorts of evidence for this. Shakespeare's universal appeal is unparalleled by any other writer. He is the most popular writer in the world. The former artistic director of the Globe took Hamlet to nearly every country in the world to great success. Shakespeare appeals to the most sophisticated intellectuals, and he is performed by the inmates of maximum security prisons around the world. He may uniquely assist prisoners in holding on to the rest of their personal identity outside that of being a prisoner. He appeals not only to adults. Young children show an astonishing love of Shakespeare. The next example is a bit extreme, but my inconsolable two-month-old granddaughter instantly calmed down and watched with rapt attention for 20 minutes when I showed her a DVD of Midsummer Night's Dream. Have you heard of the term ring composition? This is an ancient circular literary structure named by the anthropologist Mary Douglas. It rebels against ending by evoking a circular rather than linear concept of time, more like the recurring seasons than like a timeline of years. Having something of a rebellious streak myself, I will end my discussion of endings with this phoenix-like literary structure. Douglas suggests we look for especially prominent chiasmus, or small-scale symmetrical literary structure, midway through the text. So, with her comments in mind, I found that Achilles' speech midway through Shakespeare's play Troilus and Cressida is a beautiful chiasmus, enacting his words about our need to see ourselves mirrored in another person's image of us. At the center of Achilles' speech is the phrase I, E, Y, E, Y, E, I to I, nearly palindromic in its symmetry. Quote, this is not strange, is repeated in the first and last lines. Two words begin with B, as in boy, in the second line, and two words end in its mirror image, D, as in dog, in the penultimate line. 
If a literary structure is nonlinear, we don't expect it to end in any conventional sense. It might close on the last page with the first part of the sentence that began the first page, as in James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake. Or think of the end of Portnoy's Complaint, when the analyst finally speaks and says, So, now we may perhaps to begin. Yes, 